desire a lukewarm heart. You either want us to be hot or cold. Lord, help us to be hot, Lord, to be on fire for you, to be drawn closer to each day, Lord. Lord, this is our prayer for this church, Lord. And you know the needs for, of everyone, Lord. Speak to the needs of everyone, Lord. Give us a heart of prayer, O God. And as we study your word today, as we look through the, this passage, O God, in, in Philippians 4, 3, 3, 13, Lord God. Lord, I pray for your wisdom and guidance, Lord God, as we study your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God. I would like us to read this passage together, um, starting with verse 3, uh, verse 12 to 16 of Philippians chapter, chapter 3. And this will be our no, passage for today, for today's message. Let's read this together. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made, made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal also that to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Philippians 3, 12 to 13. This has been my, my life verse. And I'm always encouraged by this verse. I don't know if any of you already encountered this verse in Philippians and have memorized this passage. But this is a very, for me, this is a very important passage. Because it tells us something about how we should think as Christians. It, Paul was very specific in this passage. He was only talking about one thing here. That's why he said, one thing I do. And, 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 and this one thing that he is trying to tell us here, I believe is the key to how we are to live our Christian lives and live it successfully. Live it successfully. This has really given me strength. I struggle with a lot of things, but this passage reminds me of a lot of things and, and helps me be strong in the struggles that I go through. You know, life is more than life is more than food, more than more than survival, more than clothing. You agree with that? To that? Because some, sometimes I know this past year. Probably many of us. For us, it's just to make it through through the month or through the day or through the week. Uh, for many of us, it's life is just survival, right? And and, and, and we just think, oh, what's the, what is the next exam? I need to survive this next exam. I know for Claire as a student. For some of us, I just need to go through the next salary and, and then I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be able to pay my bills, pay the mortgage. So for many of us, of us, life is survival. Uh, at work, I know you just want to go through the next project. Once the project's finished, oh, it's it's over. Then then you go to another project again, <laughs> and it's another uh, survival mode to, to go through that project. And, and I was like that in my job. <laughs> it's just one project after another, and and after, after you're done with a project, you survive a project, another one comes in, and and and, and it's. Uh, really a survival mode. But the Bible tells us that life is more than food, it's more than drink. You remember Jesus in Luke chapter 12? He said that, that the kingdom of God is more than food and drink. Right? Uh, you, you can go to the passage in, in, 12, in, in, in Luke chapter 12. It talks about do not, that we should not worry about such things, about the basic necessities in life. Because God will provide whatever you need. But what he wants us to do based on that passage in Luke chapter 12, that we are to seek his kingdom first. And these things that you need will be given to you. Meaning our priority, our aim is not just for survival. As Christians, we don't live just to survive each day. That's not our, 
mode as Christians. Our mode, our, our, our way of thinking, our way of life is to accomplish the will of God, which is to seek His kingdom first. And, and so, I, how are we to do this? How are we to accomplish this? How, we are, how are we to seek God's kingdom first? And, and this is what Paul is talking about in this passage in Philippians 3. And, and he's giving us the key to be able to live the, the kingdom life successfully in this passage. One of the things that, that I've seen in, in the past, and even in my own experience recently, a lot, a lot of us, uh, I know Filipinos are fond of this as well, where we, we had all this accomplishment in the past. I, I, had, uh, I used to attend, I joined art competitions when I was a child, uh, in grade school, high school, and I have all these trophies, right? Uh, either I was, for a long time, in those art competitions, I was always second place. Another kid, I forgot his name, but he was a big kid. Since grade one until I reached grade six, I'm always second to him. I've never been first place. He was very good. He was very good. I'm always second. I've been third, second, but never first place in my whole six years of elementary experience with this guy. And my, my mom always takes me to those competitions twice a year sometimes. And he's always there. He's a, he's the, his uncle is a well-known artist in our hometown, so that's why he's, he's good. <laughs> and, and so, and, and, and the only the, the good thing is that on our last competition, when I was four, in fourth year, in my fourth year in high school, I finally got first place. <laughs> but that was the last competition. And praise God for that. I didn't thought I think I, 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 I became first place in the last competition in here. Now all those trophies are, are in, at home right now in the Philippines. And I see all those trophies. And and now I don't have any trophies. <laughs> Since then, high school, college, I started working, I don't have any new trophies. <laughs> and, and, and if I look at those trophies, I, I'm just looking at the past. Because <laughs> I haven't been attending any, I haven't joined any art competition ever since already, since I graduated from high school. And some of us live like that. We always look at the trophies of our past. We have all our certificates, uh, Oh, I am a graduate of this university. And, and the thing is, many of us live in the past. And we don't continue to grow. We, we end in those trophies and, and, and certificates from our past. But we don't have any new certificates. We don't have any new trophies. And our homes are filled with stuff that are from our past. And that's not a good way. That's, that's okay if, in, in a practical sense. but. Living a Christian life should not be like that. Sometimes, as Christians, we, we just sort of enjoy the, the joys and the glory of our past. We say, oh, I, before when I was a new Christian, I was so active, I was so faithful, I was growing. But you know, what about now? What about today? <laughs> what about the future? Some of us just keep on looking at the past and say how successful I was as a Christian in the past. I had all these ministries. I was involved in this, I was involved in that, and wow, that was good. But, you know, God wants us to live in the present as well. And to live towards the future. Paul himself thought like this. He was living in the present, living towards the future. That's how we think. He wasn't living in the past. He, wasn't, he was not like this person who was very proud of all his trophies and all his accomplishments in the past. He, he's not like that. And as Christians, we should not be like that as well. It's good to remember the past, but, but there's something about this message that's, that, that's really important and we need to understand based on this passage. So let's go to this passage, verse by verse. So Paul starts this passage in verse, verse 12. I'm just going to go into go. I'm going to go to just just uh, four verses here, uh, starting in verse 12, 13, 14. Okay, this is five verses in all. Sorry. So it starts starting with verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. 
Brothers, verse 13, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's what Paul is saying here. The first thing that said, Paul says in, in, in verse 13, he says here, Brothers, I do not consider I have made it my own. Or in some other translation, I, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it or have it made perfect. Now, you, you might be asking the question, what is Paul talking about in this passage in verse 13? Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. What is Paul saying here in this passage? Now, if you look back to this, to the, to the, to this, to the context, going back uh, to verse one in this, in this, in this um, chapter, Paul actually was talking about his past life. He was talking about his past life. He was talking about him being a Jew. He was circumcised, being a Pharisee, being zealous as a Jew, and he was also talking about himself as a Christian. He was he was serving God. Remember, Philippians is a letter that was written late in the life of Paul already. This was late in his life already. He was in prison here. And he had already all this accomplishment, both as a, as a Pharisee, as a, as a Jew, and as, as, a, as a zealous Pharisee, at the same time as a, as a zealous servant of God, as a, as, a, as a missionary. And so he had all this accomplishment. And, and Paul himself is saying that I'm not perfect. I haven't accomplished. I, have, I haven't really gotten hold of it. I haven't really... And I haven't come to a point where I really got hold of what it means to, to be perfect in God's eyes. He said, I am not perfect. And, and Paul, is, what he's saying here is that he, he, he's not trying to fix his eyes on the past. Because, you know, the life of Paul in the past, it's not, it's not very good. Especially when he started as a, as a Pharisee, right? He massacred Jews. He murdered Jews. Um, in fact, um, the time when Paul was called by Jesus Christ, he was about to, to, to persecute the Jews in Damascus. And Paul himself struggled. He struggled with sin. What Paul is saying here is that I don't look to these past things to define me as a person. These things doesn't define me, define me. And, and, and this is what Paul is saying here. One thing I do, continuing in this passage, one thing I do, if you read this passage here, forgetting what is, lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead. Straining forward to what is ahead. Paul had a lot of experiences, both as a Pharisee and as a, as a Christian. Paul, in his lifetime, he, he was able to visit around 50 cities. 50 cities and started churches in most of the cities. What an accomplishment, right? Paul himself wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. You see, how he was a very accomplished man. And, and if I'm going to ask you, was Paul a successful Christian? Was he a successful Christian? Yes, we agree to that, right? God used him mightily. He was very successful. And, and if there's someone after Jesus Christ that's, that successfully accomplished the will of God, it is the Apostle Paul. He is the Apostle Paul. And, and if Paul was very successful as a Christian, what he is talking about here is this, if he is revealing something that made him successful as a Christian. This is something that he wants to, us to know. So, so this is a revelation from, from Paul's own, own experience. So the Christian life then, the success, success in the Christian life, is not really about being com comfortable in your life, having everything you need, being problem free. Sometimes you think that being a successful Christian, you don't have any problems, you don't have any, any worries or concerns. Yes, you're not worried about God's provision, but but it doesn't mean that you're not going to have any problem. In fact, Paul himself went through, went through a difficult time. He was shipwrecked, he was hungry, 
He, he was in prison several times. So it's not an easy life for Paul. But what we find from Scripture is that Paul was a very successful Christian. He was very successful. Because he was able to exactly do what God wants him to do. He was able to exactly fulfill what God wants him to do. And called him to accomplish. Some people think that, that this is how, this is how people think this way. They think, oh, I, I cannot go to church because my life is not in order. My life is messed up. Or there's a lot of sin in my life. Or I'm not ready to go to church because my life is not really, God is not going to accept my life. Is that the right, the right way to think? No. In fact, Paul himself already told us here, I'm not perfect. I myself am not perfect. But you know, in his imperfection, he was saying, God was able to use him mightily. He was able to establish churches in all the cities that he visited. In his imperfection, God used him as a missionary, as an evangelist, as a pastor. And that's an encouraging thing for us, right, as Christians? That God is still able to use us, God is still able to accept us in our imperfection. Right? And, and Paul himself is, is really a, a, a portrait of God. That's why we should not be discouraged. We should not be discouraged when we, we go through difficult times and failures in our Christian life. Because he himself went through these things, the Apostle Paul. And, and some of us might be saying this, Oh, Lord, how can you use me? I only became a Christian recently. Maybe for 60 years I was, I was living my own life and I, 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 I live a life that's far from you, Lord. My, my past year was, was terrible. I made wrong decisions, Lord. I committed to all these sins, Lord God. And, and I cannot come to you, Lord. I, I'm, not able, you're, I'm not worth it because I, I'm not really a good person. I made mistakes. And I'm a new Christian, Lord. I cannot really be serving you because I, there's still a lot of things in my life. That, that, that's not good. You know, that's not how what God wants us to think. And this passage, this is what Paul is telling us. That we are to forget what is behind and strain to what is ahead. Forgetting here, the word forgetting here, is not really about not thinking about your past. Because the truth is, no one can forget one's past. You cannot forget your past. <coughs> right? It's all in your memories. You still remember some of your experiences as a child. All the good and bad things in your past, you still remember those things. But Paul is saying here, forget what is behind. Forgetting what lies behind. What does he mean by this? Because if you cannot forget your past, you cannot forget 2014 or, or, or whatever years that's, that's past, then what Paul is telling here, it seems impossible, right? It seems impossible. Because how can you forget what lies behind? So is Paul giving us an impossible command here? No. There's a the, the word forget here has a special meaning. It's a special meaning. And the, the, the biblical meaning of forget here, and this is the, what, what I just got from one of the commentaries and help me understand this word forget. It means not bringing the past into the present. Not bringing the past into the present. So to forget means that, that his past, like in the case of Paul, will not have any influence upon his present and future spiritual outlook. Meaning, meaning one's past, his past, must have defined his present spiritual condition and his future spiritual condition. What he's saying also that his past does not define his present and his future. Isn't it a great thing? Isn't it a great thing that, that our past as Christians doesn't does define us? Whatever your past is, whatever wrong decisions you made in the past, it doesn't define you. It doesn't control your life. It should not dictate how you're going to move forward. That's why the title of this message is Keep On Moving Forward. Because we as Christians, 
What Paul is saying is that we are people who are always looking forward. We're not people who are always looking on what's, what lies behind. And this is what Paul is exactly saying. What defines you is your future. It's not your past. One of the blessings about this, regards to this passage in my life is that if I don't believe on this passage, if I don't stand on this passage, I should not be standing here in front of you. I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if I don't believe on this passage. Because if you know me, if you know my personality, if you know my past life, if you know my weaknesses, I have no right to be standing here. I don't have the, I'm not worthy to even stand here. Because I myself, I struggle to be consistent in reading the Bible. I myself struggle in the past to pray. There were big periods in my life where I didn't even talk to God. Because I'm going through difficult times and, and sometimes I, I don't even want to deal anything with God and go to church. There were times in my life I, 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 I behaved badly against my own wife and people I know made the wrong choices and, and, and made, made wrong decisions that led to not so good consequences in my life. And I'm saying that I myself am not perfect. And if I dictate, if I, if I use that to define what I'm going to be, I am right now and that my future is, that I can't do anything at all for Christ or accomplish anything for Him. That's why Paul is telling us to forget what is behind and strain what is ahead. We are forward-looking people. That's what God wants us to be. And your identity is not with your past, is not with your family history or whatever. It is with Christ now. That's your, your identity is with Christ. And what Paul is saying that we are to concentrate in, in looking forward to what lies ahead. And we are to press on, in verse 14, to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, every believer is actually called by God. It's not just pastors. These are not just for servants. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, you are called of God. And God has a purpose for you. And you are unique to be able to fulfill that purpose. There is no other person in the world who can fulfill the purpose that God has for you. There's no substitute for you. You alone can fulfill that purpose that God has given you. And you know, I struggle a lot in this because when, when, when we started this ministry in this church, I was telling the Lord, Lord, I cannot do this, Lord God. I am not trained as a pastor. I don't have an experience here. I said, Lord, I cannot, I cannot do this. And so there was a period in time in our ministry, and Ariel and Suzette and Leo, who was there during the time, can you tell that if there's a new pastor who comes to the church, they must start a new pastor this church. So, so I was always deferring to some pastor who come to our church. And there were at least three pastors who came to this church. And, and I said, because I don't want to be the pastor of the church. So I always ask somebody else to come in. And, and it was, I think, on the second or third pastor where <laughs> where every pastor that came in, we had conflict, and there was trouble. And now, after, after a while, I felt it was back on my feet again. I said, okay, it's back to me again. <laughs> and what am I going to do with this? It's like something that got, it was like a hot potato, I would say. Church, okay, take this. <laughs> there went, when, I, when the trouble comes, that potato comes back to me. <laughs> it's my feet again. And this was back in 2008, 2009, way before we started this church. And, 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 and and God was rebuking me and saying, oh, this is not something for someone else. This is something I, 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 I planned for you. This was not, and you're keeping on passing it on to somebody else. And, and I remember Ariel mentioning something that encouraged me. I don't remember exactly his words, but he did encourage me that time. And, 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 and reminded me that this is something that we need to do. It's not something that I, I, I can just pass on to anyone. And you know, sometimes we struggle with it. Because sometimes there are difficult times in this church. I said, Lord, send a pastor, Lord, <laughs> and who can help us more than this. And, and I realized it's the same words of Moses. You remember Moses when he was, he was sent by God to go to the Israelites in Egypt, uh, Egypt and the Lord said, Moses, go, I will set my people free. And Moses said, eventually, 
Lawrence and somebody else. <laughs> and, and you know what God's reaction was? God's anger burned against Moses. God was so angry. And remember how old Moses was when God told him? He was 80 years old. And, 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 and when Moses said, God said somebody else. You know why God was angry? Because God spent 80 years training this guy, preparing this guy for, for his purpose. And Moses even didn't know about it. For 80 years, God was just been training him. And you know, it's the same thing with your life. When you became a, Christians, a Christian at 40, 30, 20, or 60, or 80 years old, it's, the, it's God's right timing. And in those years that you didn't experience God or know Him, He has been at your side all the time. He's been preparing you, training you. Because our salvation is not just, it doesn't begin with the moment you accept Jesus. It doesn't begin there, although you are saved at that point. But it starts with God's plan. It's God, it started before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible tells us. That, that God has already placed in His heart to bring you to salvation. Before the world was even created. It has been God's plan. So, so when you were a child, when you were um, a, a young person, a young adult, as you grew older, God has been with you during those years. Preparing you. Using your experiences, circumstances to transform you. That at the moment of salvation, God is saying you are ready. And, and from that moment of salvation, God has a purpose, has a calling for you. And as we face 2015, this is what this is the mindset we want all of us want, we need we need to have. The mindset that we all need to have. That we are to look forward to God's purpose for us this coming year. I know each of you, God has placed something in your heart to accomplish. If you are a believer, a follower of Christ, there is something in your heart. A desire, a longing to do something, certain things. And it is the Holy Spirit that's prompting you, telling you, Ness, or Carlo, or Letty, one and two. <laughs> God, uh, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And this is something I want you to do. In my heart, there's always this desire. It's, not, it's a desire that doesn't go away. It's always there. And I know God is giving this, me this desire. And, and our, our responsibility is to run to that purpose. Is run towards that, that purpose. If, if you go back to verse 12, the reason I skipped verse 12, because this is where Paul says, Not that I have already obtained all this, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You see this statement here? That when you became a believer, Christ made you his own. He has called you to be for a purpose. Now, our responsibility now is that what Jesus made us his own, our responsibility is to take hold of that, is to make it our own. <laughs> See that? That God has given us something, and our responsi responsibility is to grab that, to that something, grab onto that something. And what is that something? It's in verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a call of God for all of us. Now, in practical sense, in practical sense, let me just give one example. For instance, there are times in your Christian life where you're not able to pray. Maybe you're not able to go to church. Maybe you're not able to read the Bible and you, you're going through different sins. You struggle. And for many, for a long time, maybe a year, let's say, extreme. Maybe for a year, you're not really talking to God. Now, point in your life came, you realize, wow, I, 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 mess, I mess up, I, I, I'm not faithful, I, I, I'm not walking according to the will of God as a Christian. So what are you supposed to do? Are you just going to be feeling guilty about all the wrong things you did in the past year? Are you just going to wallow in your, in your sin, in all the, wrong, the things that you did not do, you failed to do? No. What God wants us to do, once you realize that you need to change your direction, Right at that moment, start praying. Start reading the Bible. Just change the direction of your life from that moment on and forward. And forget about what happened in the past where you made a mistake or whatever sin you've done. Although stop doing those things, but, but just make that change. Make that decision to change then. Then you know, whatever happened in the past, 
in that next week that you are faithful, God will change the direction of your life. It's like that. That's how Jesus did when, when, when he dealt with people. He said, woman, your sins are forgiven. When God says your sins are forgiven, your past is forgotten. I, I have removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, go and sin no more. Change your direction. Change the direction of your life. Make a new direction. Create a new path according to the will of God. Meaning, as we face 2015, we can chart a new path, each of us, as, according to the will of God. If you are not walking the path that God wanted you to walk, you can start walking in this path right now, in this new year. And, and face a new year as if that you have nothing, no baggage of the past. That's, that's really the great thing of being a Christian. We, can, we don't have to 